Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You, you should know there is a betting pool amongst the catering staff how many good mornings one has to say before the room actually gets quiet. Um, I learned that technique from Ms. Jantausch, my third grade teacher. I'm George Walreich. I'm the president and CEO of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Um, I have been asked to say a very few words about this institution. First of all, how many of you have never been here before? Okay, shame on you, first of all. Se secondly, we are the oldest professional society in the United States, founded by 24 guys who wanted to distinguish themselves as university trained physicians in 1787, as opposed to physicians who frankly had no training. It was the central medical library for the states, and over time has grown and changed rapidly to a medically oriented, medically based, scientific, research, cultural, and social organization. Its fellowship base, some of our fellows you may know, like C. Everett Koop and Stanley Plotkin, Paul Offit, et cetera, most of the deans and chairs in, the, in town. We do several things right now. Very briefly, the Mütter Museum, which keeps growing, is the number one first date spot in the city of Philadelphia, uh, and is where people also get married. Please don't ask me, I'm a psychiatrist, I don't understand that. Uh, secondly, it's also where research is done, and we have been able to extract cholera from some of the specimens there. We're now working on a pox virus from vaccination from the Civil War. We do youth education programs. Why do we do it? Because of health care disparities, health care disparities on both sides of the examining table, the population in general and those in medicine nowadays who don't really represent the, the cultural and population ethnic diversity of the country. We have a garden. If you need some digitalis this afternoon, you can go out and compound your own, make some belladonna. We run music programs in this room that Richard Odoms, the principal of the Philadelphia Orchestra said, George, I've played in this town for 37 years looking for a hall with sound this good. Philadelphia Orchestra musicians play here about three or four times a year in, in a chamber concert. April 11th, we're gonna be honored by Yannick Neza Segan is gonna come here and play in the chamber music also. We also have lectures about medicine, about applied medicine, about issues for seniors. And we are the neutral space. There are seven medical schools in the greater Philadelphia area. We are the place that people can come and talk about anything and everything without worrying about the competitive stuff. Now, of course, there are never any issues of competition or controversy in economics or in fiscal and financial policy. One of the founders, Benjamin Rush here, was practically run out of town on a rail because his treatment for the yellow fever in 1793 was purging and calomel, and if you could survive that, you could survive a nuclear blast. Uh, but his colleagues were not terribly pleased with him. Anyway, enough about the college. Thank you very, very much for coming. Please come back, bring your families, bring your kids, bring your grandkids. His grandkids love to come here. And let me now introduce the President and CEO of the Philadelphia Fed, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Patrick Harper. Harper. Well, thank you so much, George, for having us here at your house, uh, and what a house it is. So good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for being here. I am pleased uh, to be here at the 12th Philadelphia Fed Policy Forum this is my second since joining the bank in, as president and CEO in 2015. And I'm excited, I'm really excited to continue this biennial tradition that brings together some of the world's most renowned economic thought leaders to discuss emerging research and its implications for economic policy. Now this year, of course, as you've heard, we've shifted locations. While normally this event is held at the Philadelphia Fed, we brought it here today to the College of Physicians of Philadelphia to accommodate an expanded audience for this year's forum, as you can see, and thank you all for coming. And as you heard, while you're here, I encourage you to visit the Mütter Museum. The College of Physicians has graciously offered free entrance today to its museum, 
of medical history to all of our attendees. And if you've not been here, and I saw the show of hands, many have not been here, uh, it's really a can't miss quintessential Philadelphia experience. And I must say, we in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Fed, we have a, in our headquarters, we have a lot of charms, but we really can't compete with Soap Lady and Einstein's brain. And so um, please take advantage of that. But before I begin my remarks, I do have to give the standard Fed disclaimer. The remarks I make today are mine alone and do not reflect uh, and anyone else in the Federal Reserve System, including my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. There. I can't get in trouble now, right? So the shift of the policy forum physically, it's more than just geographic, though. This year, our theme is People, Place, Prosperity, Revitalizing Our Cities. This may seem to be an off-topic for the Fed, from a focus on monetary policy and interest rates to a focus on how the economy can develop in a way that reduces poverty and inequality. But it really isn't. It's merely a different way of looking at the same issues. And the high turnout for this event really speaks to the level of interest among you, one of our key audiences, to find better ways to understand and address these issues. And as you know, we at the Fed, we have a dual mandate, price stability and maximum employment. And if you stop and think about what that means, our mission is really about creating an environment that promotes economic growth that is sustainable in the long term and provides economic opportunity for everyone. That second goal, economic opportunity, means we want growth that is inclusive and accessible across all income groups and communities. That's because when we talk about an economy, we are really talking about people. People acquiring the right skills to find stable, family-sustaining jobs. People getting the best education for their children so they can succeed. And it's about neighborhoods, neighborhoods where people can live and about the best ways that they can come up with to ensure that their communities thrive. That's where the Fed's community development function comes in, something that is near and dear to my heart and really at the heart of the bank. For the past year, we at the Philadelphia Fed have been working on our Economic Growth and Mobility Project, or EGMP. This new initiative looks for practical applications for research in the areas of inclusive economic growth. For instance, the Philadelphia Fed is involved in efforts in northeastern Pennsylvania to create an equitable transit system. We have provided regional focused research and convened stakeholders to start the process of devising a transit system in the Scranton area that gets people to jobs and to other places they need to go. And it's really a win-win. Employers need the employees and the, and the people need the jobs. EGMP is about looking at the economy as a whole, looking beyond the data. Now, that, it's not to say that numbers and data aren't important. I'm an engineer by training, so believe me when I say I love numbers. But numbers don't tell the whole story. Overall, the U.S. economy is doing quite well. Real GDP grew at a strong annual rate of 3% or better in the second and third quarters of this year. The unemployment rate of 4.1% in October is the lowest since the year 2000. But when we look across the country, there are peoples and places that do not share in that good fortune. It's fitting that we host you here in the city of Philadelphia. According to a recent study by the Pew Charitable Trust, the city has the highest percentage of residents living in deep poverty. The region's poor are concentrated mainly in the city rather than in the counties that surround it. Philadelphia has only 26% of the region's residents, but is home to 51% of the poor. So this is a good place to be having a discussion about revitalizing cities. Philadelphia may have the dubious distinction as the poorest, but it is by no means alone in the problems it faces or its aspirations for the future. You know, I travel frequently around the 3rd Federal Reserve District, which compromises uh, eastern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, and Delaware. And my monetary policy work takes me all over the world. These firsthand experiences really frame how I look at today's agenda. Because everywhere I go, 
everywhere I go in the district and outside the district. I meet people who are grappling with the same questions at the intersection of people, place, and prosperity. How do we build wealth in our communities without displacing residents? How do we plan for the coming technological innovations and make sure workers have the requisite skills to succeed? How do we promote not just economic growth, but equitable growth for all? These are the questions we'll be exploring today. As always, the, at, with the Policy Forum, we are fortunate to have a truly all-star lineup to lead our discussion. Now, for those of you who've been with us before, the structure of this year's events will be a little different. Uh, we'll be opening with two academic panels. First, Gilles Doranton from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, Ed Glazer from Harvard University, and Henry Overman of the London School of Economics will kick us off with a presentation of research focusing on place, specifically on urban growth and revitalization. Gerald Carlino, Philadelphia Fed Emeritus Economist, will moderate. Second, we will focus on people by exploring the link between education and economic mobility. This panel will feature, feature Will Doby from Princeton University and a visiting scholar at the Philadelphia Fed, and Ingrid Gold Ellen of New York University, Phoebe Haddon, Chancellor of Rutgers Camden and a member of the Philadelphia Fed's Board of Directors will moderate. Last but not least, John Fry, President of Drexel University and a member of the Philadelphia Fed's Economic and Community Advisory Council will introduce our last session that will focus on the connection between people and place and how we promote prosperity. Michael Nutter, former mayor of Philadelphia and also a member of our Economic and Community Advisory Council, will join Dennis Lauer of Cortex Innovation Community in St. Louis in a discussion. Amy Liu, director of Brooking, the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program, will moderate. The speakers are not only some of the most prominent people in their fields, but you may have noticed that some of them are among the Philadelphia Fed's most valued partners. Their participation should tell you how seriously we take these issues. I also want to note that the shift in the policy forum is the result of the leadership of Mike Dotsey, the Philadelphia Fed's Director of Research. Mike wanted to use this event as a platform for applying the same high-level, rigorous discussion of research that has always been the hallmark of the policy forum. And he wanted to do that in a way that would advance the goals of the EG EGMP. Now, I'd like to thank Mike and his team for all their hard work in organizing this event. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Teresa Singleton and her staff who lead the Philadelphia Fed's community development efforts and all the work they're doing on our economic growth and mobility project. And a special thank you as well to the members of our board, advisory councils, and visiting scholars who are with us today. Will, Phoebe, John, and Mike, thank you for joining us. We are so grateful for your participation as leaders who care deeply about the subjects we'll examine during this forum. Now, during the day, there will be many opportunities for you, our guests, to ask questions and engage with our speakers and with each other. As you can see, audience participation is written into the agenda. I look forward to the discussions you'll have here, and I thank you for being part of this year's event. If you happen to use Twitter, please join the conversation using the hashtag PhillyFedForum. So, a 230-year-old medical college may not seem an application for this policy forum. But the mission statement of this august establishment reads, to advance the science of medicine and thereby lessen human misery. It is the same sense of purpose and concern for humankind that brings us here today to address some of our society's biggest challenges. So thank you for being here. And remember, if you have the time, Einstein's brain. <laughs> Okay. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me today to introduce uh, the speakers for our first session on growth and revitalization of cities. 
the research conducted by each of these, uh, each of our presenters, has not only advanced our knowledge of how cities develop and grow, but they also have served as advisors to um, national and local governments, not only in their own countries, but abroad as well. Our first speaker is Gilles Durantin. Uh, Gilles is professor and chair of Wharton's real estate department, and he holds an endowed chair in that department as well. Prior to joining Wharton in 2012, uh, Professor Durantin held academic positions first at the University of, of uh, well, at University of Toronto and prior to that the London School of Economics. His research has focused on the cost and benefits associated with urban clustering and he has worked on transportation issues such as the effects of transportation infrastructure on urban development. Uh, Hill serves as co-editor for the Journal of Urban Economics and he sits on the editorial boards of several other prominent academic journals. In 2011, Jill serves as a, the president of the North American Regional Science Association, and he currently serves as president of the Urban Economics Association. Pardon me. <clears throat> he is a fellow of the Center, for, uh, the Center for Economic Policy Research and a fellow of the Regional Science Association. Uh, Jill served as a consultant on region, regional and urban policy for various national governments and international organizations. Importantly, he was the foreign advisor on a two-year mission on urban issues for the government of Colombia. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics, and perhaps most importantly, he's a visiting scholar in our research department. Our next speaker is um, Professor Ed Glazer. Uh, Ed is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University where he has taught since 1992. Um, he is director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government of the John F. Kennedy School. He is director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He currently serves on many, many editorial boards such as the Journal of Urban Economic Literature, the Journal of Economic Geography, and in inter the International Regional Science Review. Previously, Ed served as editor of the very prestigious Quarterly Journal of Economics. He holds many fellowships, such as being a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administrators, a fellow of the World Bank, and a faculty research fellow at the World Bank. He has published dozens of papers on either on cities, growth, law, and economics. In particular, his work has focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as centers for the transmission of ideas. He has consulted for national governments, including the New Zealand Treasury, and he's consulted on housing project market reform for the Bolivian project. He received his PhD in, in economics at the University of Chicago. Um, our final speaker is Henry Overman. Um, Henry is professor of geography in the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School and he is um, the director of the What Works Center for Local Economic Growth. He is also affiliated with the Center for Economic Performance and the Centers for Economic Policy Research. His current research interests include the causes and consequences of spatial disparities and the impact of urban and regional policies. He has published numerous articles in leading journals in both economics and geography. He has also provided policy advice to, among others, uh, the European Commission, the Department for International Development, the Department of Housing, the Department, I'm sorry, the Department for Business and Innovation Skills, the Department for Commerce and Local Government, and the Department for Transportation. Dr. Overman received his PhD from the London School in, 20, in 2000. So without further ado, uh, we, uh, we start our program. So our first speaker is Gilles. Jules at the, the podium. Well, thank you very much, Will Jerry, for these very kind words. I feel very honored to be the opening speaker today. So I want to talk about infrastructure and the possibilities of using one infrastructure uh, to, re to re 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 revitalize American cities. I should not be using a verb like this when you're a French speaker with my accent, but nonetheless, you know, that's the theme of the day. I'll do my best. 
So the three questions I want to look at today are the following. Can we, can we do well anything about well, well lagging cities with, with infrastructure, with infrastructure well investments? Can we strengthen all cities and the American economies with infrastructure investments? And what are the actual prospects of well, oops, a boom for infrastructure spending? So let me give you first my three answers and then I'll tell you how I got to those conclusions. So can we do anything about well-lagging cities? I think it's a bad idea to try to use well infrastructure to, to do well something well, well about well-lagging cities. I just think it's a bad idea here. I'm not willing to compromise too much on that one. Can we do anything about all cities and the American economy with infrastructure investments? Yes, we can do something. I think it does something. And if we don't do anything, things will go, will go wrong. But at the same time, I'm not expecting miracles. And I think in order well to do things well properly, some pretty hard questions and some pretty hard problems will need to be solved. And I'm not terribly well optimistic about that. Uh, I know it's a dark room today, and I'm saying pretty dark things, so that's probably fitting. And what are the prospects for a boom in infrastructure spending? I actually view that as pretty unlikely. I mean, you, we will all have an opinion on that one. Uh, well, hopefully, I'll try to bring some new elements to that debate. So, infrastructure investment for declining American cities. I think this is the thinking that goes behind what the, what this question is. We suspect we have an infrastructure problem in this country. We see that some cities are indeed were struggling, and we're trying to kill two birds uh, with one stone. He uh, solves the infrastructure problem and sort out uh, with the cities. But in order actually to see whether or not this is a good idea, we need to understand what drives the growth of American cities and the role of infrastructure in that growth. So actually, when we look at what drives the growth of American cities, the first thing that comes in the data is education. So you see that there's a, pretty, there's a reasonably tight relationship. It doesn't look fantastic, but there's a reasonably tight relationship. Uh, so at the, on the horizontal axis, I have the share of the population with college education in 1980. And on the vertical axis, I have population growth between 1980 and 2010. So there's a clear positive relationship. So yes, there are some places that did extremely well, like Las, like Las Vegas and Naples, without being too, too educated. At the same time, those places were actually, 90, back in 1980, were more educated than the likes of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. The second key dimension of urban growth is amenities. So this is something here that I've learned also from Ed Glazer. On this time on the horizontal axis, I'm putting temperatures in January with the idea that everywhere in this country, January is too cold, if not way too cold. And well, I moved from Canada, so I feel much better here. But, uh, so what we have here is also a reasonably tight relationship where places that have nice and warm Januarys have been doing much better in terms of population growth since 1980. So that's the second key important well, determinant of urban growth in the US. The third one is basically you've also done well if back in 1980 or back in 2000 or in, or in 2005, you've been in sectors that have done well since. So if, you, if, we, if I actually will go back to 1980, if you were like Pittsburgh with, all, with still quite a lot of heavy manufacturing, those sectors have been in profound decline ever since, and you haven't done very well. Again, the relationship is not perfect, but there's clearly something in the data. So yes, some places like Provo, Utah have managed to do well because Ancestry.com and all those things, despite something that didn't look well particularly well promising in 1980, but at the same time, uh, by and large, places that have done well were also places that happened to be back in 1980 in sectors that actually have done well since. So basically, to summarize, cities that grow are cities that enjoy an educated workforce, strong amenities, including, well, good weather, but some other things as well, and a favorable mix of economic activities. And the places that don't have that, they tend to struggle. At some level, what I'm saying here is not something that's deeply, deeply new. It's the same story that's been going on for at least, well, 30 years. Uh, if anything, it's just, well, the last 10 years were very much like the previous 20 or 30. So the question at this point is, can infrastructure help and change that picture? So this is the same picture, but this time I'm using, on the horizontal axis, I'm using lane kilometers of interstate highway back in 1980. And you see, yes, there's something going on in the data. Again, like places that 
have, that had more highways and more infrastructure back in 1980 have been growing, have been growing well faster since. And this is something, well, some work that we've done with, with Matt Turner well over the years. We, we can also make some claims that may, perhaps part of that relationship is causal. So beyond those raw numbers, we know a few more things about what infrastructures do, do well to cities. I mean, the, if you want to remember well, a key, well, a key number of places that had 10% more infrastructure back in 1980 have been growing over a 20 year period by, in terms of population by 1% more. So it's not, it's certainly not huge. Uh, what do roads do be, well, beyond well, population growth? They, do, they lead to some urban well decentralization, so places with more roads are also places that have been sprawling and sprawling well quite a bit around. We also know that there's been lots of studies on regional well, well corridors, i.e. big infrastructure that this time are no longer within the city but link one place with another, and those regional well corridors, we tend to find that by and large well, they benefit the major cities that already do well, trying to link a smaller place that's struggling with a bigger place, that's going to help maybe the bigger place, not, not the smaller place. We also find that road corridors and airports lead to some economic specialization. So if you have roads, you will tend to specialize a little bit more in activities that are road intensive. If you have a, a big, nice airport, you will tend to specialize a little bit more in activities that are airport intensive, i.e. some sort of high-end well, services where people, where people travel. At the same time, that infrastructure, what it mostly does, is not to create stuff somewhere that did not exist before. What it, what it mostly does, the evidence says, it's actually taking stuff from other places and bringing them where the infrastructure is. So the net growth effect is actually pretty, pretty tiny. Uh, we know quite a bit about transportation. We know way less about water, electricity, telecom, ports, and all of that. But the little bit we know is not that much more, that much more well encouraging. Then there's also well, something else that we need to keep in mind when uh, when we think about well, declining cities and whether or not to put infrastructure then, there well, to make them grow again, is that growth and decline in the urban world are not symmetric phenomena. Declining cities are actually not the symmetric of growing cities. They actually face really, really strong headwinds coming from actually past negative ec well, economic shocks. So it means that if you've been growing by minus 5% over the well over well, the last decade, I think well, the best guess is you're going to decline again next decade and perhaps again yet another well, decade well, after that. The reason is the following one. When you eat by a bad shock, like you had a dominant industry and this dominant industry is dying, like Rochester, New York, you're missing the, with, the digi, with the digital re revolution with, with photography and you lose a lot of employment. So you have a bad shock, some people start to leave and as people leave, actually housing, price, housing prices go down and they go down really a lot. There was a point in Philadelphia where the price of a new house, well, the price of an old house uh, was maybe 25% the, well, the cost of rebuilding this house. So it means that prices can actually fall and the, and, the bottom for a pro, and the bottom for housing prices is not the cost of construction, it's actually zero. It's actually zero. So as the cost of living well, goes down, some people that would have moved actually now, be, well, because of this very low cost of living, they, they want to stay despite high unemployment rates, very poor labor market prospect, but the cost of living is so cheap that those guys stay. And these people only end up living as the housing stock eventually will depreciate, but this is something that takes very, very long. So basically, a, dec well, a city, well, again, that declines one decade is very likely well, to, dec well, to decline again in the future. So can we do something for those places? The answer is yes. The problem is that, is, is it actually worth it? Every single calculation I've ever done on that says no, not even close, because especially transportation when infrastructure, this is really, really, really expensive. And again, the benefits are small. 10% more infrastructure, 10% more road infrastructure is 1% population growth over a 20 year period. That's tiny, tiny relative to the cost of providing this infrastructure. So even actually with policies that we think we don't really like, like attracting uh, really expensive plants, uh, seem to be more cost effective than that. And in the particular case of declining cities, again, because they're facing those really strong headwinds, uh, that's, really, that's really well difficult. 
So the cost of building suburban highways also will create more sprawl, more dispersion of the cities in cities that actually need to shrink. So this is a really complicated, well, this is a really well complicated uh, well proposition. So if I try to move to the rest of the economy, can we actually do something for cities and uh, urban development or regional development in general in this country with infrastructure? Uh, this is something that everybody knows about, right? We live in a world in, in this country where bridges tend to collapse from time to time. Roads are full of potholes. Just look around. I mean, well, 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 well you should open the window and look around. There are clearly some potholes in Philadelphia. Uh, in some places that are even worse than we are, water is going well to poison residents, uh, electricity is not always reliable, people in, uh, people in uh, Puerto Rico have been without power for many of them for nearly three months now. So that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's disgraceful. Uh, airports and ports are under strain, again go to the airport in Philadelphia, it doesn't look particularly nice, and cell phone coverage is pretty small, I live about seven miles or five miles away from here, and there's no cell phone, good cell phone will, will coverage well in my house, so there's some truth well to this picture that indeed the, the state of American infrastructure is not great. At the same time, when we look at the macro pictures, at the macro numbers, there's something slightly different that shows up. So against that backdrop of observation and micro facts, when we look at the macro picture, something is, well, it's slightly different. We actually spend about 400 billion a year on infrastructure. That's about 2.5% of US GDP. When we compare with other countries, it's actually not so bad. It's actually not so bad. And that, pic and that, picture, and that figure has been more or less stable for the last 30 years. I mean, with slight, up, slight well ups and downs, but we are actually fully comparable to lots of European countries. Okay, China is spending way, way more, but China is actually building up stuff that we've built here many, many years ago. So the relevant well comparisons points are probably in Europe and in Japan, and we actually spend well, something that's not too far from those guys. And what we spend with well, the big ticket items are, again, transportation, water utilities, and rail and transit. So this, it paints some interesting well, discrepancy here between a micro observation type thing that well, doesn't look good at all and some macro picture that looks better. So to resolve that tension, I'm seeing three, three elements. The first one is uh, the U.S. has an institutional problem when it comes to infrastructure. So what's happening, which is, which I keep, so given when my accent, I really find well fascinating in this country, is the disproportionate role that the public sector is actually playing in infrastructure in this country. You know, I'm coming from a country that's usually viewed here as a semi-communist, well, collectivist place, but in this semi-communist and collectivist place, all the highways are private. All of them, they're all well concessions. The water system is completely private and has been so for like 200 years. French water companies actually have invaded the world and it's all run through concessions as well. When you go on vacation in Paris, when you land at the airport in Paris, it's not a government thing like here. It's actually, it belongs to a private well company that's listed on the stock exchange. Uh, transit is also very often private, a lot of it, so the companies running with well, the system tend to be, it will tend to belong to the cities, but below that, it's all contracted out, or a lot of it is contracted out. So in this country, instead, highways and major roads are actually under federal control, and what makes it actually really, really weird is that this is not managed by the executive power, but by the legislative power. Actually, the legislative power, the legislative branch in this country plays a disproportionate role in the, in the decision-making process. That goes back to the early 1950s when this country was a huge laggard in terms of having no national road system, and the deal was with the executive branch is they needed a lot of money well, to build that. Uh, Congress said yes, but we want to retain, we want to retain some decision-making power. So the three implications of uh, having a system of infrastructure that's run by, that's run by legislators, uh, there's basically a great imbalance between building and maintenance. Legislators, they want to be re-elected, they want flashy projects, so they're going to go into building and they're not going to go into maintenance nowhere near enough. So there's clearly a big imbalance here. Uh, also, because there's also, well, the second issue is that they're actually giving a 90% give or take will subsidy to most projects that they will agree on. And this 90% will subsidy is actually 
leading people to build all sorts of things that are way too expensive. You know, if you want to get a new transit system, why should you go to buses and everything when you can get all your really shiny, well complicated, well expensive, well transit project with a 90% well subsidy from the federal government? So you're going to go for that. That's not, uh, that's not right well economically. And the last, re well, the last well bias well in the system is that uh, because, again, that's decided by people who want to be re-elected, the infrastructure is built where it's politically useful instead of where it's economically necessary. So this is mostly for roads, but transit projects, that's coming exactly out of the same pocket and that's subject to exactly the same biases. The ports and airports, fortunately, that's a slightly different system. We are federal agencies and they tend to do, I guess, a slightly well better job. Water is the opposite extreme where it's completely, completely decentralized, but with barely any federal well oversight, which means that if your water is dysfunctional, it's going to be deeply dysfunctional because there won't be much well discipline coming, well coming well from above. And for the rest, energy and telecom, that's mostly private. At some level, that might be working slightly better. The second problem, I think, for US infrastructure is the problem of cost. Uh, building infrastructure in this country seems to be immensely more costly than elsewhere. I would like to have more systematic evidence, so I've put on my slide some really egregious examples, so that's the one that we all know about. The second avenue, subway well expansion in New York, we've spent about $1.7 billion per mile. That's extraordinary. That's 12 times what Korea has spent. Uh, even actually France and Germany are spending only one-sixth per mile re relative to that, so that's really, really expensive. And it's, I would like to see more evidence, but it looks like building infrastructure in this country is really expensive. Why is that? So when I ask people, especially in the real estate industry, they all say regulations. And I have to shake my head and say, yes, I know the regulations here are really painful, but once I was talking with, with someone from MTA that was telling me that this 1.7 billion, maybe 1.5 billion of it was actually environmental reviews, and I just couldn't believe that for some reason. And, you know, I'm coming from France. The French government also imposes some regulations, and the Japanese and the Italians, and, and some of those regulations can be incredibly archaic and painful. Well, believe me, so there might be well, something that's particularly wrong about well, American regulations, but it's not clear exactly what that might be. Labor costs, yes, labor that does infrastructure in this country tends to be unionized and to be expensive, but so is German labor, so is French labor. French unions can be pretty tough. You know, that's, uh, I know that. So I don't see something big. Uh, you know, people talk about corruption, but, you know, yes, maybe if you want to expand the New Jersey, uh, well, Turnpike, there's, there's going to be some corruption. We know that. But have you ever been to Spain, Italy, or France, or Japan? I mean, that's, uh, that's also, so that, that seems to be hard to believe. So what two things that I think are slightly more well-promising with candidates. The first one is, in this country, it feels like sometimes well, the designs and the demands for infrastructure are overly well-demanding. We've, we've built the big dig well in Boston without displacing anyone. That's bound to have been really, really costly. Uh, and again, the funding well, formulas might actually will incentivize local decision makers to go for really expensive projects. The third problem, which I think people always talk about it, I think it's actually more minor than it looks, the, it's, you know, the US is a big country. It's a really, really big country and sparsely populated. So that's going to affect telecommunications. But I think it's a minor problem in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, some parts of the country will not have cell phone coverage. I can live with that. And that also probably matters for intercity connectivity, but this is an infrastructure that we've built many years ago. We don't maintain it well very well, but I think here we're talking about reasonably small peanuts. Something that may, that's actually more important is that American cities also have very low levels of density by international standards. So that means that we expect actually to be some values, some benefits, some agglomeration effects from concentrating, uh, from concentrating with, with infrastructure. Well, the World Bank says an, an agglomeration with elasticity of about 30%. So when you're twice as dense, you're going to be whatever, 20 to 30% less expensive well to serve. So in this country, yes, that might be part of the problem. I would like to know a little bit more about about that. So my sad resolution to this puzzle is we invest more or less the same share of GDP as the others. At the same time, 
at the same time, we get less real infrastructure out of investment, and this investment is, uh, yields low returns because it's misallocated through the institutions that decide to, well, to do that. And we would like actually, or we would need actually slightly more well infrastructure to accommodate our low density lifestyle. So what should we do when we think, imp when we think well infrastructure? We should think about the cost and benefits of those things. So for infrastructure, we have two types of benefits. We have the direct benefits. So when we build a road, that's going to lower travel times, and we can value that. And this is well something that we, that we can do well quite well. And infrastructure also brings all sorts of indirect effects. Very often, infrastructure projects are built and decided upon those indirect effects. We just need to be very, very serious about that. Unfortunately, most of the times, this is in the realm of imagination and wishes and desires more than the realities of life so uh, there are some indirect well effects but we need to do that properly and weight all those things against costs sorry I'm getting lost in my slides here we are so then look back into a more macro world is you know how much info how much should we be spending on infrastructure given all this so trying to think it at the more aggregate level, you know, we're not very good at it. Should we actually be spending more or should we actually be spending less? So the answer, I think, runs as follows. If infrastructure is neither a substitute nor a complement to other factors of production, i.e. productive capital and labor, we should basically invest, we should basically will invest a constant share of GDP in infrastructure. That might be 2.5%, that might be about 3%. Because indeed, but then because we are expensive at doing it, we will not get very much out of it. So that will be a cost well, to society and to the economy, but that's the best we can do. On the other hand, if infrastructure is a substitute to other factors of production, we should actually move away from infrastructure. We're not very good at it. We should be doing the rest. We should be trying to invent new iPhones and so on and so forth, move away from infrastructure. The last possibility is infrastructure is a complement to other factors of production. In that case, even though we are not very good, in that case, we actually want to overwhelm compensate and spend, and spend a lot more on infrastructure. So what does the macro evidence says? It says that most likely the first case is actually the relevant one. And my own little calculation, you know, with a share of infrastructure in output of 10 to 15 percent, basically that's, cons that's consistent with a, with a steady state level of, well, of investment of 2.5 of to 3 percent of GDP. So we are not, we are actually not far off. That picture is actually well consistent with other things that we know well about well infrastructure. So indeed, in my world here, if we don't do anything whatsoever and, and we have no well infrastructure, we will end up well producing zero. So that's consistent with that, and we think this is this might happen. Um, with modest effect of modest aggregate, well aggregate well effects with a share of 10 to 15 percent of, of infrastructure in, well, in output is actually consistent with a lot of the micro well literature about modest direct and indirect well effects of infrastructure. It's also well consistent with the fact that when you look at world cross-country sort of data, you're not finding a huge amount. The countries that the OECD says are the best infrastructure, they are like Japan and France, you know, if infrastructure was that important, Japan and France would be world economic leaders. Obviously, they are not. And there's also some evidence that the causality is running in the opposite direction. Uh, places that actually get good infrastructure, they get good infrastructure after many years of prosperity, like Spain, like Korea, not the other way around. So for my last minute, let me give you some suggestions about what we want to do for infrastructure. The first one is actually do some serious cost-benefit analysis. We should actually imitate with the UK, which I think is the world leader on this. We should not imitate, we'll imitate with the UK in terms of crazy well voting well, well behavior. Unfortunately, we've done that, but we should actually imitate them in cost-benefit analysis. I'm sorry, this is very nerdy, but this is the, so this is the one area. Uh, I don't expect this to happen anytime soon, but that's, well, that's something that is clearly at the very top of my wish list. Uh, something that for which I'm not holding my breath either, but we want to take Congress and state legislatures and municipal boards out of the equation. We should, act so those guys, I don't want well, those guys to decide on nothing, but they should decide on the aggregate well budgets and the broad directions of the policies, not on the specifics of them. That's a recipe for disaster. If we cannot take well politicians out, 
we want to change with the formulas and actually do more for lower capital subsidies, do more for maintenance. And then, yeah, be wild, imitate France. You know, get, get uh, well, get with the private sector to play with a bigger role with two caveats. Sometimes we do with privatization so that we can get huge rents by privatizing well to our friends because we know we're not going to be well re-elected, so that's wrong. And some of the times we also do well public-private partnerships in the wrong way around. So in the UK, for instance, here that's a bad example. When you have a subway system, the government should actually keep the infrastructure, which is expensive. They do the exact opposite. They're trying to get that off the books. And instead, they keep the, well, they keep all the operations in the public sector when the private sector could actually do a much better job. I would like to be able to rely more on user fees. I would like to be able to rely more on land value captures. That's a great idea in theory. In practice, we don't know how to do that. And I would also like to do, I would also like with the government in this country to take a longer view. And for instance, we, do, we will get self-driving cars will very soon. In order to be very well, in order to be well, very well efficient, we need well, those cars to actually well, be able to communicate with each other. We don't have the technology to do that, unfortunately. So are we going to see a boom in infrastructure spending? I'm very pessimistic. We all know the story about Congress. Uh, I have a little story about the American Recovery Act of 2009. We spent 800 billion on that. We could only find 27 billion to spend on infrastructure. So it means that actually with the potential for lots of spending on infrastructure, I think, is limited. So we're going to use, using well infrastructure well to prop up well declining places uh, is not a good idea. Infrastructure well investment more broadly well in this country is plagued by misallocation and high cost. Uh, we should try to do better infrastructure investment rather than more infrastructure investment first. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ed Glazer. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I'm, of course, honored to be here in this absolutely spectacular uh, space. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, the overlap in my policy views with Gilles is virtually 100%. The only thing I feel slightly honor-bound to remind you that private water companies in France are somewhat famously corrupt. But that, that, doesn't, in fact, that doesn't, in fact, mean that his basic, his basic advice wasn't correct, that, in fact, we should be thinking about smart ways to do privatization. Um, the, uh, where's the clicker? The clicker is here. Great. I'm going to be talking about measurement. I'm going to be talking about measuring cities. We are in a world in which the ability to measure things about urban space has completely changed through a variety of different sources. We are just starting to feel out the possibilities, and I think it's time that we also should start thinking about how to integrate that knowledge into public policy planning. Um, we have our traditional sources, of which the Fed, of course, has been a major, has played a major role over time, but including the U.S. Census, various surveys of businesses. Um, but now we can supplement them with fine-grained knowledge from cell phone records, it, data from financial transactions, and indeed even pictures of cities. For the first time in history, we can actually measure urban change from the sidewalk level, not just measuring what happens at the census tract level every, every decade. And I'm going to be talking about, about that. Let me start with one slide. Unfortunately, although this is a visual, this is a visual presentation, a lot of the visuals are going to be awful. Um, so uh, uh, let me start with one slide on uh, one of the two papers uh, that, that are queued on, which is on now casting the local economy. This is joint work with Mike Luca and Hyun Jim Kim. And what we're trying to do here is make up for the fact that while the US has fantastic local economic data from county business patterns, that data is frequently available at very long lags. And sometimes it's not available at the level of geographic fineness that we would in fact want. Sources like Yelp give us a chance to supplement that. Yelp's available at real-time basis uh, with reviews of lots of different, different businesses. And it turns out, and this is what this graph shows, that in fact, that what this figure shows, that Yelp openings do a pretty good job of predicting future county business patterns. Right? and can do it at a very fine geographic level. So if you want to know how this neighborhood is doing before you ever get anything from county business patterns or official statistics, Yelp can actually help measure that. And that's, that's what this paper shows. Um, it does slightly better in better educated places and higher income areas, right? It does much better in higher density areas relative to lower density areas. So if you were actually, if we were talking about policy making in rural Montana, probably we would make less of a case for Yelp. But since we are in fact in Philadelphia where Yelp coverage is excellent, right, we don't need to wait any longer. 
for, for government statistics, we can, use, we can use Yelp, with the caveat that, in fact, it's far from 100% R-squared. Right? You get good predictive power, but it's far, from, it's far from perfect. Now, let me switch to the main gist of the talk. And there's one paper that is, uh, is on, the, is on the, 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 the website which is connected to this, but there, there are a whole range of papers that I'm going to talk about. And in fact, it, it starts with work that I didn't even have anything to do with. It starts with work of Cesar Hidalgo over at MIT's Media Lab. And the basic goal is to try and use Google Street View and other street-level images to tell us stuff about the urban environment to tell us about how high income areas are, to tell us how urban change is proceeding, to measure gentrification not just by the share of people who are high income, but whether actually the buildings are getting, getting nicer. Um, and in many cases, to allow us an inroads into cities in places like the developing world where our measurement is, is from government statistics is awful, right? But you've got Google Street View. And indeed, when you look across the world, it is true that Google Street View is disproportionately available in richer parts of the world, but it's also available for virtually all of Latin America. There are providers that are like Google for India, there's a little bit in South Africa, and a, a lot in, in Eastern Asia as well. And we're getting coverage over time uh, that's, that's expanding. Okay, so where does this start? With Place Pulse. So Cesar Hidalgo had the clever idea that he wanted to ask people to rate neighborhoods. So they offered this fun game online, which apparently people likes to do, where they I ask people to say, does this place look, which image looks nicer to you? Or in particular, does this image look safer to you? And they got, you know, thousands of people, uh, 8,000 participants, rating 4,000 images from New York and Boston, and, if, and Linz and Salzburg as well, because of course those are two of the most interesting and important urban areas in the entire world. So naturally, uh, <laughs> they focused on Linz and Salzburg. Uh, and they managed to get uh, participants from 91 countries, making more than 200,000 pairwise comparisons. So you get these ratings of which ones uh, look safer. Now, with these ratings, you have to then turn it into a numeric score. And the way you do that is basically the same way you, ra you rate chess winners. So lots of different tournament situations. We have cases in which person A has competed against person B. Um, and we have algorithms like Microsoft TrueScale that then can turn that pattern of victories and losses into a numeric sc scale, let's say on a one to 10 rating. So they take these wins and loses and they transform them. And then you get, you know, these are low street score images, right, out of 10. And uh, one thing I, sh I should point out, and this may be obvious to you, even though these are allegedly ratings about how safe this area is, street score is actually negatively correlated with actual criminal activity. And let's see if you can actually figure out why, okay? Take a look at that image on the top. Yeah, it looks dangerous. Would you go there? Would you go there on a Friday night and just hang out? Unlikely, right? right? Nobody goes to these places that look really unsafe. So in fact, um, they, they look awful. And so I think this is actually best seen as an index of whether or not the place looks attractive versus not. And these are places that people think have high street scores, right? They're nice, uh, they look pleasant, but they're also places where people actually do get robbed occasionally. Now, so that's the start. The start is, is 4,000 images. Um, uh, no, it's, it's 8,000 images and then, let me just get this right, uh, 4,000 images from, from four cities. Now, the next ingredient in this is my co-author, Nikhil Naik. And Nikhil is a computer scientist from MIT and an expert in machine learning and computer visual algorithms. And he says, great, you have these 4,000 images. Why don't we turn them into four million by having the computer mimic what the human eye does? So they take this training data, which is the data that came from individual rankings, and you feed it into this miraculous machine for actually generating a ranking for lots of images where you don't have people ranking them. So we go from 1,700 sampled street blocks from the, the crowdsourced data to one million total street spots, blocks spanning all of New York. Um, and this uses a bunch of tools that I really don't understand very well. Need I remind you that I'm an economist, not an engineer. Um, but you start with image features, you classify them in different ways, you use uh, GIST, Textron maps, and you produce a predicted street score. And this is the relationship where you, for the, the actual data where you have both the true and the predicted street score, this is the relationship between the two. And as you can see, it's not a perfect fit, but it does, it does pretty well. You can get the fit up, and this stuff I really have no idea, but it, I think it just looks cool. Uh, neural networks essentially get the R squared up to 72%. So you get about 72% of the variation in the, the true street score with this computer predicted street score. Okay, what does street score correlate with? What areas, what predicts which, where people think density, think, think uh, streets are attractive? Well, density, right? As no one should be surprised who's lived for the transformation in Philadelphia and other American cities, density is something that seems to be 
coming back into vogue, that has come back into vogue over the past 20 years. And density makes areas look safer, okay? Income, education, also are very powerful. So skilled areas look, seem to look safer to people. Um, percent African American is actually positively correlated with street score, although the effects are smaller, and places where older people live are positively correlated as well. So this is where I get involved. Um, using street score not at a level, but as a change. Asking ourselves what predicts areas that have gotten better from a visual standpoint and which areas have perhaps not gotten better. In this case, we have five cities where we have street scores both in 2007 and in 2014. And as in the case of this image, this is a particularly stark change in, in Brooklyn, uh, we're looking at a substantial increase in street score over this time period. Um, there are places with declines, right? Uh, so I think these are, are from a couple of blocks in, in Detroit, which have actually gotten worse, and you can see why perhaps they've, they've gotten worse. Buildings have been torn down, density has declined. Um, this is a heat map of the places in New York City that have had the largest growth in street score between 2007 and 2014. And I think for many of us this makes sense, right? Downtown New York, Brooklyn Heights, these are areas that have gotten substantially tonier, substantially fancier over the past 30 years, and even between 2007 and 2014, they're areas that have, have seen visually observable upgrading in the, the, the quality of the built environment. This is Boston. That a lot of those dots are the areas around MIT. Um, you, know, you don't see so many up, so much upgrading around Harvard. I wonder if that's various biases of my co-authors. Uh, and you can also see, of course, the innovation district in downtown Boston, which went from a four, from an industrial space to a, a hub of of the information age. Um, so we can then use this to test various theories about urban change. And I'm going to highlight a couple. So um, we're going to use data from New York, Boston, Washington, uh, uh, D.C., Baltimore, and Detroit. We have about 2,500 census tracts, 1.5 million street blocks, and we're going to use some socioeconomic data from the 2000 census. And we're going to test some classical theories of urban change. Now, two things, and you heard this in Gilles' presentation, one of the things that at the macro level, at the metropolitan area level, that is most important in predicting which areas do well is education. It turns out the same thing is true at the block level. If you want to predict which parts of DC or New York or Detroit have done better in upgrading. They're the places that had more educated people living there in the year 2000. They're also the denser areas. Denser areas have also seen more upgrading. And the places that uh, have more edu educated people are also what you see on the map. So this is uh, over there that's density, sorry, density, ed share education, street score in 2007, and the street scores change. And so you can see there that the places with higher educated people were also places that had the larger change in street score. So the second thing we test is the classic tipping hypothesis, which goes back, of course, to Grodson's and Schelling, which is that places that start off looking nicer get nicer over time. Places that look crappy decay. Well, on one level, this is well borne out by the data. So here you're looking at change in street score on the initial level of street score. And as you can see, it's a strong positive relationship. Here, of course, we've been scattered them. So it would look much messier, just like Gilles, Gilles' graphs, if I actually showed you all the data points. But we've averaged them for each initial street score line. And as you can see, it's straight positive. The one thing that is slightly different from usual tipping versions is that unlike the 50s and the 60s, the places that looked bad initially aren't actually getting worse. They're just not getting faster, they're not getting better as fast as the, as the better educated places. These have been a relatively good seven years for cities, despite the, the Great Recession, and so these places have generally received upgrading, but much more so in the places that started with higher street scores. Another theory, and of course we, we know this right here in Philadelphia, right, is that problem spread and success spreads across space. We've seen this in the gentrification literature when people have looked at, let's say, income of the census tract. Incomes have gone up typically close to the central business district and close to other fancy areas of the city. It turns out the same thing is true of the visual upgrading. The places that had the fastest growth in upgrading were places that were close to the central business district. And remember, we already saw this in downtown New York and in Brooklyn Heights. The places that were close to the hub of Wall Street experienced the fastest upgrading. Then places that are near to other nice places, places that are near to places that are better educated, places that are near to higher income, the success spreads over space. And that's exactly what the invasion hypothesis that the great urban sociologists at the University of Chicago were talking about in 1925, although in their case they were talking about urban decay spreading over space. Um, Okay, that's, that's this paper on urban change. Now I'm going to switch to a slight interlude before I go to the next paper, which is not released, uh, but will be hopefully by the end of next week. So the slight interlude is about whether or not, how well imagery predicts income. 
Can you say how rich people are in a block from the picture of it? The reason why that question is actually important is particularly in the developing world, where we have really kind of crappy income data, particularly over space. And so if you can actually predict income from the imagery, you can actually tell whether or not, let's say, a new highway that was built in the area caused an upgrading of the, of the community's wealth or not. So for this, we started with data from New York and Boston. So we started with imagery like this. We did census tract level data. We are now using the computer vision techniques, starting with the income data, and we tell the computer to predict income based on the pixels in the photograph. Um, so you start with these training examples, you have it fix this, and you get a predicted income. How well you do you do for New York and Boston? Spectacularly well, okay? Out of sample, and again, these things are all done. This is on the training sample itself. This is on the testing sample. So you take images, you take census tracts that are not in your original testing sample. You can explain about 80% of the variation in income from the street. So I don't know if any of us would be as good as picking it up, but the computer actually can tell from the imagery how poor or rich this neighborhood in New York is. Somewhat amazingly, a New York trained algorithm can also do equivalently well in Boston. Okay? I'm not saying it can do that in Dallas, let alone in Kuala Lumpur, but it, it, it can in Boston. Now, we started to do this in the developing world. Okay? Our first utter disaster was in Jakarta, where we, we tried to do this with a sample of disproportionately poor Indonesians, and it was a complete fiasco, in part because none of the addresses made any sense. Okay, so we, we, we had an absolutely impossible time fitting the addresses to anything that Google Street View recognized. And secondly, it turns out, although Google Street View claims to have coverage of Jakarta, they actually don't have good coverage of the peri-urban areas where the poorest people live. So we then moved to Chile. We decided Jakarta might be too hard. With Chile, we got R squares of about 30%. You can explain about 30% of the variation. And it turns out that there's actually something interesting about urban space that lies beneath that, which is that you can actually pick out rich, Indonesia, rich Chilean neighborhoods. They look fancier, they have good upkeep, they have trees in front of them, and you can pick out the poorest parts that are falling apart. But in the broad swath of the middle of the Chilean income distribution, all the houses look more or less the same. And it's not just the computer. If you look at the images, they, they look that way. And there are two possible explanations, one of which is that actually if you are a middle-income Chilean, you actually don't want your home to rich, look rich, that that's an invitation towards, towards bribery. It's sort of akin to the fact that you know, for much of the last 30 years, rich Brazilians have all driven around in armored VW uh, cars, right? Because the last thing they want to do is bro be broadcasting their, their wealth. Um, the second point is that maybe external appearance is kind of a luxury good. That in fact, if you're in the middle of the income distribution, it doesn't make sense to spend on making your house look a little bit nicer. What you want to do is spend on basic necessities of life, and only when you start getting richer do you spend more. Okay, last part of this talk. Housing price evaluation. How much can you tell a book by its cover? How much can you tell about the value of a house from its appearance? Um, we're going to be doing this with Boston data. Um, there are obvious practical values of this, right? If the, the computer can do as well as an in-person assessor, why do we need person assessors anymore. Um, property values are also interesting because of public policy questions. There are a whole bunch of urban policies which are related to the fact that people seem to care about what their neighbor's houses look like. Right? One of the big justifications for historic preservation policies, like ones that give us buildings that are spectacular like this one, is that neighbors like to look at nice buildings of their, of their neighbors. Another urban policy question, which is relevant, is we're going to be able to test whether or not the event of going through a foreclosure Right? And I am mindful here that we are at a Federal Reserve pr program, uh, so I, I feel uh, honor bound to bring up issues relating to the banking system. Uh, if you go through a foreclosure, do you actually see a visual depreciation in the quality of a house because of you know, the, the morass of the foreclosure and so forth? Um, so we're going to be able to try and do that. So we start with, again, our image of our images. We then connect this with sales prices for Boston. Uh, where we have 480,000 single-family homes, uh, uh, no, 48,000 single-family homes in our data, 26,000 condominiums that are sold between 1986 and 2016. We have complete administrative data from the city on their sales price. We also have all the data from the assessors, right? So we actually know what the assessors carried as well. Uh, and we have street score images for all the properties evaluated from images captured between, it's a little earlier than 2009, 2007 and 2014. Okay, so let's start with a couple of simple hypotheses. The first one is the architecture puzzle. Does appearance itself drive price? The second question is the urban design cousin, right? Does your neighbor's appearance drive your price? 
And the third sets of questions are mostly going to be about do changes in incentives, like those created by a foreclosure, where people are living in a house who you know, have no long-term interest of actually keeping it up, do they actually drive, uh, do they drive investments that impact appearance? Okay, so the first thing we do is we basically orthogonalize with respect to neighborhood. There is a lot of truth in the old real estate adage that it's about three things, location, location, location. So we basically wipe out as much of the variation in price as we can possibly do with location, with a combination of using neighborhood uh, controls and longitude and latitude. And then we ask, uh, how much does the price actually predict? And you can't read that. Uh, let me just tell you what it says. What it says is if you don't include any other controls, the visuals can explain about 11% of the price variation. Okay? Not 50, not 90, 11. It's not nothing, okay? but it's not huge. If you al also include the bevy of normal characteristics that real estate economists have been using in housing price regressions, you only add about 2% to the R squared. Okay? So it's a, it's a relatively small added number. So the idea that you can actually predict within an area like Boston, add meaningfully in a huge way to our predictability with visuals, the answer to that is no. Um, that being said, you still do a lot better than the stuff the in-person assessors pick up, because they add really almost zero to the predictive power over these basic characteristics. So if you actually thought we were getting a perfect fit, the answer is no. But if you thought that you wanted to get rid of your human assessors and replace them with computer-based algorithms, the answer is that's probably OK. Um, the, as a massive R-squared booster, this failed, but it does do better than the in-person assessors. Um, and uh, there's also a question of whether or not this generalizes. It's quite possible that Boston is a place that's particularly driven by, by location relative to, let's say, this great Sunbelt metropolis. You may get more out of the visuals elsewhere. The second thing I don't want you to take away from this is that it's not as if the visuals are irrelevant, right? And this is a standard economist point, that in fact, one question is how much of the variation in prices do you explain? The second question is, do the visuals actually increase the price? And the answer is, the visuals increase the price plenty, okay? I think this is, this is the, so this is, a, for those of you who are research economists, this is a T of about 28 on the overall visual index. It's certainly very strongly correlated with, with price, just doesn't give you a lot of the R squares. Another way of thinking about this is a one standard deviation increase in the visuals are associated with about... Uh, about $55,000 of, in of increased price. So you're not explaining the, much of the variation, but it does really matter, and, and that shouldn't surprise us that much either. So um, this is the, a graph that goes along with this. Again, this has been scattered. So this is giving you the visually predicted price and the actual price, and you know these are big differences. So the beginning, between the top and the bottom, you're seeing a 40% di difference in price uh, between the nicer and the less nice places. Um, if you add in Zillow images for the interior, your added R squared goes up from about 2% to about 5%. So the Zillow images do have a fair amount of added predictive power if we add interior as well as exterior images. Okay, now the policy question is not really about whether or not a nicer home is valued more by the homeowner. It, it is, but you know, I'm not sure that that was an obvious thing that we cared about. A more relevant public policy question is, do the neighbor's homes matter? Do we actually have some justification for policies like historic preservation that try to boost the whole, whole neighborhood? So what we do here is we take a home and we then match it controlling as well as we can for everything about the neighborhood, we match it with its four closest neighbors or its eight closest neighbors. And we ask, how much does the price go up as the neighbor's predicted price goes up, right? And um, the answer is, uh, okay, I'm gonna skip over. The answer is a 10% increase in the quality of the neighbor's home as measured by the price has caused your home to go up by about 7%. So it's a pretty big elasticity. Your neighbors seem to get as much of a benefit, almost, from your home looking nicer as, as you do. One possibility is this uh, reflects omitted neighborhood characteristics. And again, we try to control for everything. But one of the ways we do to correct this is we, we look at homes that are on the same street as you, that you can presumably see from your house. And we compare that with homes that are as close geographically, but are on a slightly, have a slightly different street address. And so consequently, the difference between those we think may be getting us the difference between visually observable neighbors versus not. And with that, you see there's about a 15% larger impact for the visually observable neighbors than for the non-observable neighbors. Um, that same fact shows up if you use the assessor's uh, verdict on the exterior condition for other homes. Now, the last thing I'm going to say in my last three minutes is using visuals as an outcome. So for this case, we're going to take the visuals in 2007, the visuals in 2014, and we're going to ask, can we predict the changes in these visuals, and do things like foreclosures matter? The first thing we do is we look just at remodeling, okay? So we look at whether or not the home has pulled a remodeling permit from the city of Boston. The average remodeling is associated with a $25,000 visually observable increase in the value of the home, OK? 
okay? So each remodeling permit on average scores 25K more. We did earlier work to, to show the street score work, showing that you also saw increases in street score when you saw large scale urban projects in the area. So this is basically a sign that the, that the, that the technology is working. We then look at foreclosures, okay? This, this is before remodeling, after remodeling. They look nicer. The, the next thing we do is we look at foreclosures. And with foreclosures, of course, the, the hypothesis has long been out there that if your home goes through a foreclosure, the whole American housing stock depreciates, people don't take care of it. This was a very big hypothesis during the Great Recession. Um, often it was based on the fact that foreclosed homes sell for less. But that could be due to lots of things other than just the, the depreciation of the house. That could be due to the rushed nature of the sale or the depressed nature of the local housing market. What we're able to do is actually look at whether or not the physical quality of the home depreciates. The big challenge in this is, are these homes being compared apples to apples? So we use a technique called propensity score mapping to try and compare each one of the, the homes that are going through foreclosure with five similar homes that are matched on every characteristic that we possibly can, including, including neighborhood. What you find with this, so these are some images before and after foreclosure, what you find in this is um, a, a difference in about $15,000 in depreciation of the visually predicted price for the homes that go through a foreclosure. So that's about 3% of the value, two to 3%. So it's not the 30 to 40% that some of the estimates that came off of just lower prices came from, but it's real. It's a real cost. It does appear that the people who are owning and then reselling uh, foreclosed homes have let it depreciate a little bit more. We do two more experiments with this data, one of which is looking at resale and the other which is looking at home ownership. One of the big challenges in using resale price indices like the Case-Shiller Index is that it is possible that homeowners jazz their homes up before they sell. So all of these indices could be upward biased if the houses that sold have had extra investment in the upkeep, making them non-representative for the housing market as a whole. Now Case-Shiller have always excluded homes that explicitly, paid, explicitly pulled remodeling permits from their data. But it's still possible that there was some upgrading that occurred, a new paint job that they didn't get a permit for. Well, for those of you who use these resale price indices, the answer, at least from Boston, is good news. That in fact, there is no visually observable increase in the, the quality of the resold homes relative to propensity score match neighbors. The second hypothesis, and, and that I'm, I'm sad didn't work out, is there is an old fact associated with Schilling, Sermons, and Dibrow that found that rented single family homes lost about 1% of their value per year relative to houses that were owner occupied. Again, the wear and tear associated with renting, the lack of sweat equity that renters put in falls behind this. So we're able to test this by comparing similar homes that are owned and rented in Boston. And the answer is, at least from the street, you don't see uh, any visible difference. Now, that may still mean that there's stuff going on inside. The things that are associated with visually observable change are likely to be the most contractible forms, the things that a landlord can easily see and will likely be paying someone else. Whereas the things that are sweat equity, you know, those may well be going on in the inside of the house, and we can't actually say that. But at least visually, right, you don't see a, a huge difference between the renters and, and the landlords. So let me just wrap up with this, that in fact, you know, the world of big data is here, and the computer scientists are unlikely to make it work for policy on their own. Right? What we need is partnerships between people who will come from the policy-making world and computer scientists to use this to its, to its utmost. We can now measure neighborhood change with tools like Street Score. We can measure the very physical essence of a house by using Google, Google images. Right? And when we do this, we can learn new facts, like the fact that your neighbor's appearance matters a lot for your house. Right? Much more than I think I originally thought it did. Right? Um, doesn't, still, still doesn't make me a fan of every form of uh, historic designation, but uh, it, it does, in fact, do, seem to support the view of, of these neighbors with spillovers. We also are able to measure what things are associated with changes in the external quality of the home, and we find that foreclosures are associated with about $15,000 of less value, and remodeling is associated with about $25,000 of more value and little difference between owned or resold properties. And let me then end, end there. Thank you, Ed. Henry Overman is our next speaker. So thank you for the invitation to talk to you. I should say that, um, that the organizers have set me a hard task, which is that uh, I'm an incredibly jet-lagged Brit that they've put in a dark room speaking after Ed and Gilles, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, 
uh, challenging to say the least. So I I'm going to do my best. Uh, I'm also going to try and pick up a little bit as, as I go along on, on how I think this, this li links to what, what Ed and, and Gilles have, have both been saying. So this is what I want to talk about. Do we know or care what works? I spend a lot of my time now, I'm actually 90% bought out by the British government to provide them uh, with policy advice on local economic growth and trying to improve uh, local economic growth. So what I'm now spending a lot of my time doing is trying to take the insights uh, that Gilles, Ed, uh, myself and others have, have generated over a number of years and think about how to take these into the policy space. And it's a, it is a huge challenge. Uh, partly because uh, people don't want to hear uh, the policy messages that emerge from that stuff uh, in a way that, that Gilles has perhaps made clear. So let me give you a feeling for the challenge. Look, I work in the UK. Uh, I'm not going to you know, insult your intelligence by pretending that the UK is exactly the same as the US, Brexit and Trump aside. But um, you know, I, we do face some of uh, the same challenges, although I would say that, and this is a conversation that Ed and I have had many times, I think our challenges are somewhat less pronounced uh, than your challenges for reasons that we can go in with uh, if people are interested. But I certainly think that there's lots to be learned uh, from one another. And I certainly have learned a lot of, uh, from, from the work that's been done on the US. So look, here's, here's the challenge in the, in the UK. Uh, we have uneven development. It's nowhere near as profoundly uneven as here, but we have a very rich London and the South, and we have a poorer uh, Midlands and north of England, right? And so when we talk about revitalization in the UK context, it's basically, you know, what can we do to fix the Midlands and the north? And what can we do to try and fix poor areas within the more successful areas? That's pretty well what I, what I, what I spend my life trying to do. So let me start with the big picture, all right, about what we think are driving those spatial disparities. And here, actually, I'm going to uh, pick up a lot of what Gilles did uh, in a slightly different way. So what are the drivers of uneven development? Uh, the first thing is something that, that Gilles mentioned, which is that uh, it depends what industries you get. You know, some industries are booming, some are declining. And the other thing is that some industries benefit a lot from being in big urban spaces and other industries don't benefit very much at all. Okay. So uh, here's a list, ranked by how much we think these industries benefit from being uh, in big urban places. You see that, look, manufacturing is still something that benefits from being in urban space. If you want to see that dynamic in operation, just look at China. You know, we know that we've got booming cities there that are producing a manufactured output because it's better to be a manufacturer in a city than it is to be in a, in a rural environment. Uh, the big push in, in China found that out as well. Um, but for our countries, you know, the story is somewhere down the bottom of this slide, right? Which is that our economies are structurally shifting towards stuff that uh, is towards the bottom of this uh, ranking here, and that's stuff that benefits a lot from being in big urban spaces. So you either believe the economists on this or you believe your common sense, right? If you look around, you know, where are the places that you associate with finance, insurance, real estate? They are big and urban. Okay. So quite a lot of what explains uh, the changes that we're seeing in time, over time and uh, the differences that we see across the economic landscape come from this uh, what you do and how what you do relates to city size. Right? So quite a lot of what's going on in the UK is that we shifted away from manufacturing to services over a period of 50 or more years uh, and some cities have won in that process and others have lost out. What's the second thing that uh, works to reinforce that? The second thing to work to reinforce that, Gilles also highlighted, which is about skills. Right? So alongside this uh, shift in the economic geography uh, of what gets done where, we've also seen increasing concentration of skilled workers in particular cities. So what I've done here is pick the top 10 places. Some of these will be familiar to you. So you know Oxford and Cambridge have 50-odd uh, percent of their working age population with a degree. The average in the UK is 25 percent. So, you know, we have some urban places which have a large concentration of higher skilled workers, and that's because they are doing these things that are uh, increasingly becoming concentrated in those places. Gilles, again, put that up. That's something that we see in the US. What's the picture I'm not going to show you? I'm not going to show you anything to do with weather. All right? Um, Ed and I have discussed this, you know, you guys have the stereotype about, right, it's sort of miserable and grey everywhere most of the time, right? We have nowhere that gets as cold as, 
as places here get in the winter and we have nowhere that gets as hot as places here get in the summer, right? So, you know, climate, at least at the moment, plays a much smaller role. We're also a much smaller country, and this will come back to, to matter when I talk about the big policy predictions. But certainly, this business of um, a shift towards stuff that benefits from being in cities, the, the industry that you're in mattering a lot for what's going to happen to you, and the concentration of skilled workers happening a lot for explaining whether you do well or badly, these are all things where the UK parallels the US. So uh, I, stated, I asserted that um, these two things are positively correlated and reinforce one another. This is just the picture that demonstrates it. So this is some, some research that we've done where we follow people as they move around over place, right? And we try to break their wages down and say, okay, how much of uh, what we see uh, is uh, driven by the individuals and how much of what we see is uh, driven by the area? And this actually is just developing work that uh, Gilles and, and Ed, Ed were, the, were the leaders in pushing in the US and the French context. Uh, so what do we see? You know, if you're on the right-hand side of the bottom axis here, you have lots of high-skilled workers that would earn high wages wherever they were living. And if you're at the left-hand end, you have got people who uh, will struggle in the labor market wherever they are living. And then uh, on the left-hand axis, you know, if you're at the top of the left-hand axis, you are somewhere that is able to pay people higher wages, right? So conditional on their characteristics. You know, London is a good place to work. If you're on the bottom of that scale, um, you pay lower wages to people, you know, conditional on their characteristics. Now look, there's a, there's a trick to presenting these diagrams which uh, uh, I've, I've learned over the years, which is that there is a reason why the bottom left-hand corner I try to make places as hard to read as possible. Because, uh, you know, you put that up, you get hate mail, right? No one wants to be... No one wants to be the place that is full of low-skilled workers or is not very productive. Whereas on the right-hand side, it's perfectly fine for you to be able to read uh, what the name of places are, okay? So what do you get from this? You know, you see somewhere like London at the top there is, uh, you know, what drives London's success. It's a combination of the fact that it's the most productive people in the most productive place. Now, what I think is interesting here and what links directly to something that Gilles was saying is let's take Burnley. So Burnley is an area in the northwest of England near Manchester. Okay? Any of you that read the FT will have seen a discussion about Blackpool this week. Uh, so Burnley and Blackpool are kind of similar. What's interesting is, you know, what are the policy prescriptions of Burnley? The policy prescriptions of Burnley at the moment are to get infrastructure into that place. All right? But look, you know, Burnley is uh, basically the, the problem with Burnley is nothing to do with how productive firms are in that place. The problem with Burnley is to do with the fact that it has large concentrations of workers who would really struggle wherever they were located. You shift those, London to work, those workers to London with huge infrastructure uh, advantages, they're going to be struggling. All right? Yeah, of course, they're going to be somewhat better off. You know, I'm not saying that infrastructure makes no difference. But if you really want to understand what's going on in those places, it's, poor, it's the concentration of poorer workers. Uh, that is the major issue. So what have I tried to, to tell a story here? Look, I mean, it's Ed hinted at this, you know. I mean, the one problem you've got with your panel here is that you're going to struggle to get disagreements, okay, unless you really start pushing at that French-English-American nexus somehow, right? Um, but on the broad economics, we are, you know, we, we, we're kind of coming from the same sort of space. So what do we think is driving these things. It's technological change and globalization, and I think we would all put more emphasis on technological change than on globalization, although there is a slow drip, drip, drip of evidence that perhaps globalization is slightly more important than we thought. It's a shift towards services that benefit from agglomeration, and that drives uneven development. What's it reinforced by? It's reinforced by two factors. One is that it comes with a concentration of skilled workers. The other, actually, is, uh, is something that comes from Ed's uh, recent paper on this, which is that we actually increasingly think that that concentration of skilled workers reinforces those agglomeration economies. So Ed has a very nice set of diagrams where he divides the world into skilled MSAs and unskilled MSAs. And you see that for the skilled MSAs, uh, size is very highly correlated with productivity. For the unskilled uh, MSAs, size is less strongly correlated with productivity. So that tells us something about the fact that you know, we have agglomeration sucks in the most productive industries, that then sucks in the most productive workers, and that there might be something that uh, reinforces this sort of positive cycle to really pull our leaders out. And of course, at the opposite end of the, the urban uh, city, system uh, of cities, that 
you know, the opposite is going on, right? They're caught in these downward spirals where the industries are declining, people are, uh, the, the higher skilled workers are moving away, you're left with a concentration of the least skilled workers, again, for reasons that Gilles talked about, uh, and then, you know, those places tend to do very badly. So how do we understand the breakdown between these people and place effects? Uh, in the UK, here's a favorite thing that politicians do. Uh, I don't know if they play this game quite so much here, but they played a lot in the UK. So a, a politician looking at spatial disparities uh, and trying to make the case of why we've got to do something about the poorer places will tend to take the poorest place in Britain and compare it to the richest place in Britain. Okay. So here's what happens if you do that. If you take the poorest place in Britain uh, and then compare it to the richest place in Britain, there seems like a 67% difference in uh, average wages. Mike, we've got to do something, right? You know, just these places that are just doing appallingly badly. We've got to get in, made huge, in uh, you know, huge investments there. So two points to note on this is that comparing extremes is a really, really poor guide to policy. Right, so what I do here uh, in the top row is just say, what does that look like if you go to the 10th percentile, the 90th percentile, or if you go to the 25th and the 75th percentile, you see those things shrink down a lot. The other thing is that we know that people differ, and if we really wanna know how much is going on people versus how much going on place, we need to control for the characteristics of individuals so we can really decide whether it's the place that is driving stuff or the individuals that is driving stuff. Now here I do think there's a difference to probably to the US, which is that I think in the UK, place plays a less important role, right? Because we're a smaller geographical space, we have less extremes, we've got a higher safety net, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still amazing to note that once you actually look at what happens to an individual as they move between that worst place and that best place, their wages only increase about 16%. Now look, over a lifetime, that adds up to quite a big difference, right? But it gives you a feeling for the fact that two-thirds of those disparities are just explained by the composition of the people that live in the place, okay? They're nothing to do with the performance of the place. And that's hugely important because the right policy intervention will really depend on whether we think it's people or place. Gilles hinted at this a lot. You know, the race to infrastructure puts all of it on place, all right? Uh, that, and that's before we even start to think whether or not that infrastructure investment can really shift the place very much. I mean, that's a subtly different question. Whereas in practice, a hell of a lot of this is to do with the fact that these have become the, pla the places that are struggling are uh, the places where people who are struggling to function in the modern economy have just ended up. Okay. Look, let me make a, a second point which sort of starts to uh, relate to, to the second point I was making there about the fact that even if uh, you attribute it to, to place to some sense, you need to understand what the effectiveness of your interventions are going to be. And I'm afraid that, you know, we don't have much success in shifting the relative position of places. So on the bottom axis here is average wage in 1998. On the... Uh, Y-axis here is average wage in 2008. Now, this is a period where the left-wing Labour government spent a huge amount of money, or at least a relatively large amount of money compared to what we're going to get uh, under the current administration, on trying to get poor places to catch up with rich places. Now, your eyes do not deceive you. The line that I have plotted through there has a slope of one. All right. So between 1998 and 2008, on average, we did not manage to shift the relative position of any of those places at the bottom. There was no convergence. The interesting thing here, actually, is that the British government spent a, lot amount, a large amount of money during this period on place-based interventions to try and turn this around. Now, if I broke this down and showed you what happened to place-based interventions, uh, the, to the place-based effects, you do notice a slight convergence. Right? So we threw all this money at these place-based things. You get fractional convergence. So all these shiny buildings, all this infrastructure investment was doing something. What happens, well, what happens, I'm afraid, is that the sorting of skilled workers completely undoes that. So it became slightly more pronounced in the period. We end up with places in the same relative position as where they started. So, you know, do we know what works in this, in this kind of situation? Well, we, we have a pretty good understanding of what's driving these disparities. There are strong market forces that is driving uneven development. And yes, sure, you can use government policy to either reinforce or counter these market forces. Here's the issue, though, where you get into the policy community. You really need realism on policy effectiveness 
what's driving those disparities and the extent to which uh, we can rebalance them. And the rebalancing debate in Britain at the moment is absolutely obsessed with infrastructure investment as a way of turning, turning around these declining places. And, you know, I'm in complete agreement with Gilles here. You know, the evidence just suggests that infrastructure investment is not these places' main problem. And even if it was, additional infrastructure investment might not be the, the vehicle for, for turning those places around. What's the issue when you get into the policy-making world? My goodness, constituency-based politicians do not want to hear that. I mean, if there is anyone here who is, say, a, a, a councillor or a, a mayor for a struggling city, you know, if I was in Britain, they would come up and harangue me to death, right, when we finish this. But, oh, it's so, you know, you, 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 you're just giving up on our place. You're just arguing against infrastructure investment in these shiny buildings. No, you know, that's not what we're doing. But we're trying to get you to realise really where the problems are coming from. It's not just local politicians that struggle with this. You know, I've been advising uh, the British government since the early 2000s Every incoming government fails to recognise the underlying economic factors and uh, starts off with the position that it is going to rebalance the UK and make everything look more equal. Uh, and all of them fail. Okay. So let me get to uh, the slightly more positive set of things that we try to do, which is uh, what I now spend my day doing, which is uh, going and saying, well, look, okay, that's the broad picture, but we know there are a suite of policy interventions that we are going to do uh, in each of these places. Uh, and what do we know about the, the effectiveness of those policies and how to make them more cost effective? All right, so that's where my current sort of day job is. And I've roughly been doing this since about 2013. So this is really what the What Work Center does. So what do we do to try and help them answer this? We do uh, evidence reviews. We do some capacity building work. Uh, and we run some demonstration projects when we go into local areas and help them try and pilot and test new interventions to try to deal with the challenges that they face. What's the idea here? I mean, the idea here is that by doing all of this, you understand what works. There's still then a capacity building thing that says somehow we need to embed that into decision making. So Gilles mentioned, for example, which I won't touch on very much, but you know, we have good systems for thinking about how to do benefit cost ratios. They miss a bunch of the things that we care about, but actually the number one pro challenge there is making sure that that uh, analytical work is uh, provided to decision makers at the point at which they are doing scheme prioritization so that it actually underpins the decisions that they make, right? So there are major challenges you know, at every step of this process. I just want to give you a little feeling for how much we know about policy effectiveness. Now the What Work Center, we have a strong remit to focus on impact evaluations. So what we're trying to do is come along and say, look, when we uh, make an investment, uh, what changes for the individuals, firms, or areas that are supported by the program? And uh, how does that look uh, when we go out and compare to a similar set of individuals, firms, areas that weren't being supported by the program, right? So that's what I mean by impact evaluation here. Those of you who are economists, we basically do regression, propensity score matching, and above. Those of you who aren't, it's changing outcome for those in the program um, compared to those that, that, uh, that aren't getting support. So here are the suite of policies that places try and do, right? So you look down this list, right? Infrastructure is in here. Public realm is in here. Um, but here's, here's the general set. We do access to finance. We do apprenticeships, broadband, business advice, employment training, estate renewal, innovation, public realm stuff. We invest in sports and culture. We do transports, enterprise and empowerment zones. And all right, for, 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 for a limited time period only, we care about EU policy in the UK, right? Um, so here's something that's interesting when you start to think about policy effectiveness in this space and, and helping places really develop their policy. So the first column here says how many studies uh, claim to be evaluations of these, right? The, the, the third column says how many of those uh, have a before and after comparison for people in the program compared to a, a similar group of individuals that don't. There's no typo here. If you go to something like Access to Finance, you start off thinking you're going to have 1,450 studies to read that claim to be evaluations of this. Once you actually start reading them, I mean, I don't do this. I have a huge team of people that read them. We find 27 across the whole OECD which involve a before and after comparison for a group receiving access to finance support to a, a comparison group that are not. Now, these numbers are getting better all the time, but it gives you a feeling for the challenge that policymakers are having if we haven't got good impact evaluation to tell them what on earth is working for them. The other thing to notice from this is that um, 
the uh, fourth and fifth column are uh, how many of those studies look at employment and how many of those are positive. And what you'll see is that basically our policy uh, effectiveness on most of these policies is at or, at or below 50%. So, you know, 50... Now, depending on whether you're a glass half empty or a glass half full kind of person, right? This is either appalling news or brilliant news, right? I mean, it's either that 50% of these policies fail, right? Or that 50% of these policies uh, actually have some measurable impact against stated objectives. Now, increasingly, what I find is that people seem really to fall into two camps here, neither of which are very helpful, which is that people are at one or the other of the extremes. So uh, you meet some people, when I was given the uh, What Work Centre said, oh my God, it will be the uh, absolutely nothing work centre, right? Which is a slightly extreme uh, viewpoint, you know, one which you will see some colleagues sort of espousing, which is absolutely nothing works. Or at the other extreme, you have people that just believe that absolutely everything we do will work and the only problem is about funding, right? And neither of these groups of people are right. The truth is somewhere in between, which is that sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. Now, actually, I'm going to highlight here public realm because I'm going to talk a little bit about impact evaluation. Public realm is an area where doing impact evaluation is very, very tricky. Um, but it's hugely important, and this is some of the stuff that Ed is really pushing, right? And it's really important because policymakers want to spend a lot on these kind of public realm things. They really care a lot, and we have no impact evaluations for that stuff, all right? So where Ed's work is going here on putting together the big data is going to be starting to fill out, you know, a set of huge gaps in our understanding uh, of a policy area where people like to spend a huge amount. So look, uh, you know, we, we don't... We're not actually as successful as we would like to be when we start spending money on these things. So what else do we do? So the second thing that we do is come in and say, okay, we'll drop the evidence bar a bit and just say, look, um, if we just did before and after comparisons when we'd introduced a new feature on a program, or we just look across programs with a feature and without a feature, can we do a little bit better in providing guidance? So I'm not going to take you through these in any detail, but just to, you, you'll have to have a look at the web page, but just have a feeling for what we're doing here. We're basically saying, all right, if you, were, uh, if you have careers counselling as part of employment training, better or worse, what if you introduce financial incentives to get people to study, better or worse? What if you require pre-qualifications? What if you send people reminders? Uh, for business advice, you know, what if we appoint people with mentors as part of a program? Do public advisors do better or worse than private sector? How does subsidised consultancy do? Should we be really tailoring support or is generic stuff more effective? What do we know about training, you know, entrepreneurial training? So, you know, we keep working through these. So, you know, where do we get to out of that? Well, we know much more than we used to before we started doing this. Where are we? I think we know stuff about the relative effectiveness of different policies. Employment training, say, versus sports and culture. I mean, I guess US politicians are obsessed with sports and culture just like everyone else. These are public good uh, and welfare instruments. They are not uh, economic development instruments. We know about the relative effectiveness for different objectives. So, you know, actually innovation grants and loans are surprisingly good at doing R&D at the firm level, increasing innovation. They're not necessarily so good at driving employment. We know about relative effectiveness for different areas. Uh, this one's never popular with the rural constituents, but uh, we know, for example, that broadband is more effective in urban than rural. It's going to be more effective for high skilled than for low skilled, and it's going to be more effective for services than it is for manufacturing. And then we want, you know, we do a bunch of stuff on what determines effectiveness. Now, look, there are still huge gaps in our knowledge, and I think we're doing two things that are vitally important to filling them. One of which is that we're trying to learn from local interventions by doing more piloting and testing. We're trying to do uh, stuff to speed up the innovation cycle here, where we basically get in and really pilot stuff. So think how to implement, think how to monitor, think how to evaluate, test and improve before we roll out. I know there are initiatives, the What Works initiative, uh, Cities Initiative in, in the US that is pushing similar things. And then actually, I don't have a slide for it, but I'm very sympathetic to Ed's argument that big data is going to be a huge part. Uh, in improving our understanding of some of these where trialling and control trials, etc., are, are not a big part of the picture. So let me uh, take the last minute or so to finish up. Where are we with the detailed stuff? Um, look, this is really challenging. I can't tell you how difficult it is, actually. I thought getting published in academia was hard, but actually getting this stuff embedded into policymaking is really difficult, especially when it goes against strong prior beliefs. 
I spend a lot of time just getting shouted at by people uh, who think I'm an idiot, right? And, uh, you know, the one thing I'm not is an idiot, but uh, uh, still, uh, you know, I get shouted at a lot. There are capacity and resource constraints. Most people working in local economic development have no economic training or very little economic training, and that makes it very, very hard for them to, do, to understand basic uh, issues uh, to do with the policy. There are huge risks for uh, an area in terms of robust evaluation. Uh, it's very high risk, low benefit from a government perspective because p politicians and uh, decision makers get killed by the media if things get wrong. The other thing is that we spend a lot of time arguing uh, just about centralization versus localization, state, federal, et cetera, et cetera, rather than focusing our energies on trying to improve policy effectiveness. So, uh, sorry, I've gone one minute over, but let me sort of finish uh, just a couple of notes here. So where, where do I think we're at on revitalizing uh, big cities? Uh, revitalizing cities. So I think uh, the big picture is the following. We need realism about the underlying market forces. I uh, hadn't seen Gilles' side, but I'm completely in agreement with it. We need to invest in infrastructure in areas where it's likely to increase productivity and generate jobs. In the UK, that is uh, places like Manchester and Leeds. I'm afraid it is not Blackpool and Burnley. What do we need to do? Now, Patrick, in his comments at the beginning, actually uh, talked about the work uh, that the Fed have been doing on uh, linking in place with the transport. I'm afraid I don't think that that will get us completely there. Barking and Dagenham in Britain is a 20-minute commute on uh, the best transport infrastructure you're ever going to see from the highest employment concentration that we have in Britain. It has some of the worst socioeconomic outcomes. What's the missing part of the puzzle there? The missing part of the puzzle is we have to get in and make sure that these people have the skills that they need to, to access the new jobs. The other thing I would say on this is that, um, and I'll, I will stop here, the other thing that deeply, deeply puzzles me in this space, and it's something that we have in all the detailed work that we do, but people seem to think that trickle-down works at the area level. I find this completely confusing. Right? So we seem to have this idea that getting me, Ed, and Gilles to move into some poor neighborhood is going to uh, miraculously help out the people that live in that poor neighborhood. All right? I don't understand how we've got there. If you want interventions that are going to help the poor people who are stuck in uh, declining cities, then we need interventions that are directly targeted at those disadvantaged people with a view to improving their life, life outcomes. The idea that what we can shuffle the deck chairs on the Titanic and that somehow there'll be a miraculous benefit when people like me move in next door to a poor family, I think this is crazy. I'll stop there so we've got some time for discussion. All right. Thank you, Henry. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. For our speakers. Ryan, have a question? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, very informative and, and uh, appreciated. Uh, the, the, there's a underway right now, uh, and, and for some time, uh, a major force in, in the economy, and it's accelerating, is, is, the, is the force of, of automation. And um, in, many, in many sectors, it's, it's, it's quite, quite robust. So the measure that you're taking of success is increased employment, which is actually the economy is working against it. It's actually trying to minimize or reduce the amount of employment. Uh, isn't the issue really uh, income distribution? I mean, is, if you really want to increase the welfare of people, isn't it just simpler just simply to give the money away since the machines are producing it and it, without distributing the money, the economy and markets are going to be destroyed in any event? So isn't the real solution just simply income redistribution? I, I strongly disagree with that view. Uh, and let, let me just you know, uh, say where, the, where I think the data is on this, which is that on almost any measure of human welfare, the gaps associated with income are tiny relative to the gaps that are associated with non-employment. Whether or not we're looking at self-reported uh, life satisfaction, whether or not we're looking at opioid abuse, whether or not we're looking at divorce or other problems, 
a life without purpose, a life of idleness, is a horror, right? And the view that what we should be doing is just accepting that 30% of the American workforce is going to be jobless and we're just going to pay them off is, to me, an absolute travesty in terms of, of a future for America. Um, it, you are, of course, absolutely correct that we are fighting against a, a force of globalization uh, and automation that makes things harder, but that is not a reason to give up on trying to find a future with purpose for less skilled uh, Americans. And that's a hard task, um, and one that almost assuredly requires investments in education, uh, but it's not an impossible task. That for centuries, new forms of technology have been replacing existing workers. But throughout most of our history, entrepreneurs have come up with new ways to find work for people. That process is still going on. Uber finds employment for, for people who have been let off jobs, but there needs to be more than, than Ubers going forward. Act as a war on work, right? As indeed the way that we structure disability payments that actually requires you not to work uh, to get them also works in this. So we need to figure out a way to be generous, but also to make sure that we are facilitating people uh, people's employment rather than working against it. And a, a, a nice example of how to do this comes from the work of Magnus Mongstad on di reform of disability in Norway, where they enabled disab disabled workers to take home more of the extra work that they do without losing their disability payments. And they worked hard, right? They found, they found jobs, they did things, and, and their lives were better as a result. Um, actually, I, 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 my, you, you my point. To, sorry, can I, can I, let me just add on that. The, uh, actually, I have a lot of sympathy with, uh, with what Ed has said there. You have managed to pick something where you, you might expect that we slightly disagree. I mean, the, I was asked this question recently uh, whether or not I thought the Labour government would narrow spatial disparities in the United Kingdom. Um, and actually, I said I thought that they probably would narrow spatial disparities in the United Kingdom because they would be more redistributive. So I think there's a, there's a sense in which, at least sort of in terms of uh, narrowing spatial disparities, being more redistributive does help with it, right? So there, there is a reason why we don't have Detroit, we don't have Baltimore. Some of that is to do with the economic mechanisms in play, but some of that is to do with the fact that our national system is very redistributive on education expenditure, very redistributive on healthcare, et cetera. But where I do agree with, uh, with Ed is that you know, in some ways that then ends up missing the point because, you know, if, if all you're doing is just redistributing within this but without really improving people's possibility to, to make a contribution to society, you know, you've achieved on your headline objective, you know, that average wage disparities have come down, but who cares? You know, who, if, if the fix is, to, is just to have redistributive stuff without uh, giving people the, 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 the chance to contribute. Uh, I think that's a, a policy solution that, that doesn't fix the problem. And, and just to be clear, I'm, I'm not speaking against ag aggressive forms of policy action that would right inequities at all. I'm in fact in favor of them. I just want to make sure that they, they are in fact targeted towards increasing employment not, rather than reducing it. Right? By all means, let's think about ramping up the earned income tax credit in a way that gets more people to work. Let's think about having a national minimum wage, but one that's paid for with a subsidy rather than by forcing the, the employers and the customers of less skilled workers to actually pay that, pay that penalty. Let's start reversing the 40-year trend where we've gone from having one in 20 prime-aged American males working to not, not working to more than three in 20 not working. Uh, a number of, of you used uh, the uh, number of uh, college graduates or the proportion of, of college graduates is a s significant factor explaining employment growth and so on. But the number of college graduates in the population is a function of two things. One, whether or not the in, there are industries there located there which need uh, college graduates and the quality of the education. But if you separate that out, the quality of education uh, in, across cities is, turns out to be a very significant uh, dis, uh, explanation for population growth, for, for employment growth. Those are very different uh, variable than uh, the, the population, uh, than the number of college graduates due to uh, the nature of the employment. Uh, I think that the 
need, we need more emphasis on the quality of education as an explanation, because the, the data show that. Uh, and uh, anyway. Yes, I, I fully subscribe to this idea. We look at a fraction of people with some college or university education or degree or whatever, because that's the thing that's readily available from US census data. Uh, quality of education is really, really fundamental, and I think uh, the city of Philadelphia is unfortunately a pretty sad example here. Uh, we, so we need to think about that long and hard. What's also happening is there's two things about education. There's the education that people bring with them when they move to a city, and the education that attracts them, uh, the quality of the local education that attracts with those guys for their own children. Uh, I moved to Lower Marion for a very good reason. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd add to that, which I think is that I think in all the work that we've done, it, it's absolutely, you know, we use things as a shortcut here. You know, percentage share graduates is, is an easy thing uh, to measure, but actually uh, in most of the econometric work we are doing, we are actually really picking up not just your measured education, but also things that um, are sort of unobserved about the individual and might be related to the quality of the education they received, innate uh, abilities, innate characteristics, etc. For sure in the UK data, the big sort is on uh, those innate characteristics that seem to, you know, so not all graduates are equal, right? You know, LSE graduates earn a hell of a lot more than uh, non-LSE graduates. So that <laughs> I suddenly realized I should be very careful on that. Uh, on that statement but so I think in all the work we do actually I'm pretty sure that's true for all all of us right that it's not just narrowly measured education so in terms of share uh, that matters there really is something about the sort of innate ability and characteristics of people um, that uh, is, is really a strong part of that sorting across space I um, this may be a question for Professor Glaser in your continuing work with street score, I wonder if you have looked at the correlation with walk score, which is embraced by the real estate community, and is there any uh, reason to look at the interdependence between these two scoring systems, and might it skew actually the bigger discussion on infrastructure development uh, in the future, which primarily focus on roadway construction right now? So yes, there's, you're absolutely right. It's important to uh, to do more connecting the two things. One of the problems, so you know, I love the idea of of doing more with visuals to actually measure how the the area actually works for pedestrians on the ground. I think that's incredibly important. As many of us remember, Holly White in the 1960s did these wonderful movies of how people use plazas in, in New York City and told us about how these public spaces work. There is a great failure of Google Street View, though, as a tool for this, which is they make those pictures at 5 a.m. in the morning when no one's out on the streets. So you actually have to get the drones going and actually take, take pictures of, of how people are using them during, during every day to make, make progress on it. But of course, you know, I agree strongly with the basic hypothesis that pedestrian life is incredibly important for the life of the city, and I think in the future we will have much more in terms of the visuals of, of measuring that and measuring its larger impact on urban life. I'd like to raise the, the question with specific reference to Philadelphia, and I appreciate the presentations that were made by each of the speakers. But on the question that is the topic of this conference, with respect to Philadelphia, one of the major issues that is bound up in this is the issue of race. There was reference earlier to the inequality in the distribution of income. But in both Philadelphia and in this country at large, the great inequality is in the inequality in wealth. The disparity in wealth between African Americans and whites is greatly different, is much larger than the inequality in income. There was reference made to the high poverty rate in Philadelphia. Well, almost half the resident population of the city of Philadelphia is African American, and the rate of poverty among African Americans is four times as high as the rate of poverty 
among whites. So I'd be interested in any thoughts the panelists might have, either of the panelists, on this question of policy. Because in America, policy is very significantly influenced by wealth. And if we have such a disparity in wealth, how can we get the policies that are necessary to relieve and resolve the kinds of issues we're discussing here? Well, let me try to answer that because, as you know, my accent is not from South Philly. So as somebody who moved here, who moved to this country six years ago, yes, I, every morning I actually cross city line from Lower Merion and I enter the city of Philadelphia and I find those things every single morning uh, that never really became usual to me. I just find it baffling. I cross one street, I cross a red light at some intersection and uh, income income per household is falling by a factor of three, uh, rates of unemployment are skyrocketing, and the whole, layer, indeed, the whole makeup of the population is so completely different. As somebody from, well, coming from Europe, I really find hard to believe this is so extreme. I'm not quite sure what to do. The only thing that I really, I'm really dismayed with is indeed, at the moment, the, at least at the national level, the political winds of or if anything, uh, pushing in the opposite well direction, and uh, I really find it well very, well very sad. Beyond that, I don't think I have any particular well expertise on race. Uh, the, at some level, this is, a, this is a very American problem, and I'm not quite sure what might be done about that. I just feel that indeed, at the moment, the, the federal, well, the federal, the federal government is going just in reverse on those issues, and uh, that's not great. I mean, I'd, I would add to that. I, I, I similarly, you know, don't have to deal with these issues in, in quite the same way in the context in which I work. I, I do think I'm going to make a slightly more general point, though, which is that my feeling is in the UK, we spend a huge amount of our energies arguing about deep structural issues. And, you know, we don't have race, but there would be but there would be others. Gender differences would be another example. And I think these arguments are hugely important to have. I mean, they're one of the reasons why I became a social scientist. I do think, though, that there is scope for making progress on the effective policy responses that don't necessarily need us to fully address those structural problems. Now, that's not saying that we should leave those structural problems. And clearly, if those structural problems persist, you know, you only get so far with policy effectiveness. But I do think that sometimes uh, I would like to see more of our debate on uh, issues around uh, policy effectiveness and sort of less around the sort of heat and light on those huge structural issues where, I, you know, the solutions are beyond me. So, so I, I actually have written papers on racial segregation in America's cities, um, which you know I, I believe is a terrible curse, and um, that uh, you know, the, the lives for African American children growing up in less segregated cities in the 70s and 80s was much better than the lives for African American children growing up in, in more segregated cities. The fight against segregation is a is a hard one, um, and like many economists, I like housing vouchers. I think the evidence for moving to opportunity when housing vouchers were tied to um, moving to lower poverty areas uh, is relatively positive at this point in time, that actually people who, who got out, who moved into areas that were less concentrations of, of poverty were, were more successful. And I think we need to continue to experiment on policies that break that legacy, right? that, that awful legacy of, of uh, walled, you know, ghetto walls that bound back opportunity. Let me, though, take a slight twist on, on your emphasis on wealth, which is, of course, you're right, and of course, it's important. But I think we have to stay, and I, I want to harken us back to the previous question, that, that the most important wealth is the wealth that's inside our heads. Right? The most important wealth is human capital. And in some sense, this was the subtext of what both Gilles and Henry were talking about, which is that too often when thinking about cities and urban renovation, we have emphasized the observable and the physical. Right? Because we mistake the city for its skyline, for its roads, for its monorails, where the real city is the humanity that's connected by that city. And the reason why I hate the Detroit people monorail 
is that I hate the fact that $300 million was spent on that absolutely useless piece of machinery instead of on the children of Detroit. And that the real answer going forward is that we have to, as a country, understand that every time we screw up with a kid's education of whatever race and whatever place, we are wasting our nation's most valuable asset. Well, we have time for one more Can question. I? Okay. Um, Shall I be the last, or is there someone else who's going? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, first, I want to thank you very much. It was a really interesting um, session and, and just very provocative, and I appreciate it. I also want to especially acknowledge the gentleman who went before me and the question that he asked. Um, you know, uh, I have a, a comment about that I'll make quickly and then a question for you. Um, you know, the work that I do relates to home ownership and for a particular segment of our country, um, you know, wealth creation is so tied to home ownership and African Americans and Latinos and others have been, you know, negatively impacted by the Great Recession comparatively relative to other populations. And so I think that's something that we definitely have to look at. Um, I spent half of my week, uh, half of my month in Texas, in Dallas, and in Austin. I'm a Philadelphian. And so my, my question um, really, and my comment goes to what Jill said about um, infrastructure. And I have to say that f for years I have just bemoaned being in Texas and seeing, you know, the roads just go improve, 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 and go for days and days and days, and then come home, have to drive home on the School Click Expressway. You can imagine how sad I am. So, so I, I thought your comment about um, private ownership of, of, of roadways is very interesting, and it actually causes me to rethink kind of what I think about the school kill now. Um, one of the things you didn't talk about, and I wanted to um, ask you in your assessment, you, you didn't talk about proximity of work and play and home, and uh, you know the removal almost of transportation um, infrastructure in supporting prosperity and, and economic growth in the community. And so have you looked at that at all um, or looked at, you know, the proverbial smart commuting sort of concepts? Thank you. Well, that's actually a lot of questions embedded into one. <laughs> so let me try to throw just some, some elements of answers, but certainly I won't do justice to, uh, to everything you raised. The first one is Indeed, we've tended to build in the past, or we've built in the past, uh, elevated highways and all those things that now are being torn down, and that's probably a good thing. I mean, there was probably a need for those things back in the day. Uh, you know, I'm not against, I've, I'm spending quite a bit of my life in uh, developing countries, and I'm, for many of them, I'm not against uh, flyovers and bypass and all those things. Uh, at the same time, you know, when Korea is taking those things down, they've become rich, and that's probably something you want to do because uh, the amenity values of those things is really, really low. It's extremely negative, actually. So you, that's perfectly fine. In terms of where people live relative to where they work, actually, it looks like in large American cities, if anything, the distance between job and, and residence is going up, in part because you have lots of people that in the last whatever 20 years have decided that they would prefer to live in central cities. And they, they actually work outside of the city because jobs keep decentralizing. And I think since you're taking with the, with the school kill, uh, well, from time to time, I do as well. Uh, I'm actually moving, well, going from suburbs when I come well, to the Philly Fed, which is about once a month, I'm actually seeing that the flow out is worse than the flow in. Like the big, well, the big well, traffic jams in the morning are to exit with the city. So the things are changing. And here in Philadelphia, we're seeing a big rise in reverse well commutes. Uh, you know, at some level, I understand what's happening and why. I'm not quite sure whether it's a great thing or not. That's a complicated question. Uh, yes, jobs keep, uh, keep moving further and further away. People, at the same time, they like living in central cities. Uh, you know, that's the way it is. We, indeed, we'd like them to be able to move more in an easier way, but I also know from previous research from Matt Turner that if we keep expanding with the school, with the school kill, it will keep well filling up anyway. 
That, that's that's sort of a central point about this, right? That that is the fundamental law that is you know among among Gilles' many really central contributions to the field of urban urban economics is uh, empirically documenting the fundamental law of highway traffic: the vehicle miles driven increase roughly one for one with highway lines built. The economist's answer to that for over 50 years has been congestion pricing, has been charging people for where they, where they drive when they drive it, which gives you another, another reason to think more seriously about public-private partnerships in the case of road building, where you naturally have a stream of revenues that both pays for the maintenance of the road and also pays, also charges people based on time of day, based on traffic, based on uh, where they're driving. This gets particularly central, and I want to just highlight this issue going forward, as we imagine a world of autonomous vehicles. Okay. What autonomous vehicles do is they radically shrink the cost of sitting in traffic. Whatever engineering benefits you get from that right, will be swamped by the fact that many more people will be willing to sit in traffic, and so our roads will only get worse unless we price them, and we price them from the beginning. Because one thing we know about the political economy of America is you can't slap a charge on something that used to be free. But if you give something something new and it say say comes with a cost, you can get away with that. New highway comes with a toll, you can do that. Which is why it's so important to get some form of congestion pricing, GPS based on autonomous vehicles from the beginning. And maybe that will be particularly natural when we think about intercity transport, where you will get you know perhaps privately built roads that specialize in only autonomous vehicles. And it may also be returning again to the idea of rail that for many interurban connections, that a bus going an autonomous bus going 100 miles on that road that is only uses autonomous vehicles may be a much more cost-effective way of delivering transportation connections than, let's say, an, a much more expensive rail, rail connection. So let me just uh, add one final thing on infrastructure. So I'll, I'll do a plug. So uh, I, there's, there's a great um, not-for-profit in, in the UK called the Centre for Cities that, that I work with sometimes, and I actually did a podcast for them on, on Friday with, with a woman called Bridget Rosewell, who, who's one of our sort of leading people on, on urban stuff that was specifically on, on transport uh, infrastructure. So if you want to hear you know, what I think about it in more depth, you can have an hour and 15 minutes uh, to lull you to sleep um, in the evening. I, I think the thing I, I would just stress on this is that you know, in terms of revitalization, you know, we, I think, you know, have strongly made the case uh, that, of course, infrastructure development and getting infrastructure right is hugely important in our more successful cities in, ma in managing the problems of success. And I agree with, with both Ed and Gilles that the pricing probably forms a part of doing that effectively, uh, along with a decent public transport system for, for the really large cities. Uh, but, you know, a lot of what Gilles said was that, you know, we need to be super cautious. And again, this is something that I was pushing too. We need to be super cautious on the extent to which infrastructure investment is going to turn around uh, cities that are struggling. And I guess that I would just uh, emphasize uh, that I think that point also holds intra-city. Uh, yes, I think it's hugely important that we uh, get the transportation system right and that uh, a poor transportation system can be a barrier to people accessing jobs, etc. Um, but we need to be really careful about its uh, effectiveness as a poverty reduction strategy within cities because it gets capitalized into land prices. Uh, and, you know, time and time again, we see uh, st cities building infrastructure into poor neighborhoods that essentially results in state-led gentrification that drives the poor out of those neighborhoods. And we have to, you know, this is one of those which... Uh, economists just push again and again, but where poli many policy people struggle is that, you know, we have to think about what the response will be. Uh, and way too often in the UK, we see schemes that uh, are done out to deprive neighborhoods uh, in the name of poverty reduction for the individuals that live in those neighborhoods, where the primary uh, response, I'm afraid, is that those uh, individuals that get that live in those poor neighborhoods get priced out of those neighborhoods and have to move to somewhere that is potentially even further away. So we need to be hugely careful when we think about uh, how um, these infrastructure investments within city uh, can be used uh, to try and target uh, poverty reduction. I think their role is massively overstated if we don't take into account this, uh, this policy led gentrification. Apparently I was mistaken. There is one more question before lunch, so. Hi. Thank you so much, Pedro da Costa from Business Insider. So I'm a reporter and not an economist, so my job is to summarize what you guys have, have said to, to outside folks. And it strikes me that first there's a certain irony in the fact that we're talking about 
the growth and revitalization of cities, and we have a panel of all white men uh, who did not address the issue of race, as was previously pointed out. And there's also a sense that um, uh, any help that's given to the poor becomes a disincentive for them to work. And I think it was John Kenneth Galbraith who pointed out that academic economists who are tenured like to talk about job insecurity as helpful to the economy, but always in the second person. So I'm wondering, uh, why are you so against anything that helps poor people, considering that those who, among like yourselves, who are in your class, have so many layers of support that come from their communities, their families, their inheritances, their social circles, etc. Thank you very much. Oh, come now. That is a gross mischaracterization of what we said. Please don't, okay. please don't, please the, don't uh, condescend me. Thank you. Please don't, please don't condescend me. Thank you. Okay. When, when we were talking about uh, redistribution, I said it once and then I said it again, that I was strongly in favor of added aid to the poorest Americans. And I, the key is to design it in a way that encourages rather than discourages em employment. That is not a statement that says we should do nothing about this at all. This is a crying national crisis and we sh all need to be absolutely aware of that. And we need to be doing more for, for the poorest Americans, not the opposite. I did not. I absolutely did not. I'm in favor of spending more money on poor people. And indeed, let me, let me throw out, restate the concrete thing which I said, which is a nationally funded minimum wage which directly supports poorer people if they work. Well, look, so this is a, an argument which uh, I, I feel I'm caught in the middle of between two people. But let me just say, you know, I get this, uh, you know, I get this kind of criticism all the time. I, and I categorize, you know, I, I actually am with Ed. I don't see uh, how you listen to what we were saying and come to the uh, conclusion that we don't think that you should be spending money on trying to address the problems that are faced by poor individuals. I explicitly said it. You know, I said that the problem with policy in this space is far too often we propose things that seem to rely on the magic of trickle-down uh, and that I don't believe that trickle-down works and that the only way to address the problem of poor people who live in poor cities is to invest in public policy that supports them improve their life chances. I said, I said that, I'm saying, I said it in the talk, I'm saying it again now. You know, what I don't think benefits these people is to pretend that high-tech clusters, uh, huge amounts of money spent on innovation policy, large amounts of money spent on infrastructure is doing anything to address the huge challenges that they face. So, you know, I just, I'm, you know, the, the, the idea that somehow I don't care about the poor and, and that they should be abandoned is just really offensive. So you, you say that... You know, Ed is patronizing you. I say it's just offensive to, to take the comments that we've made uh, and suggest that, that we don't care about the poor. I mean, it's precisely because I care about the poor that I think that far more of our uh, expenditure should be focused on actually directly dealing with the challenges that they face. Oh, well, thank everyone. It's, it, it, I... <laughs> I understand lunch is on two floors, so 